Hey everybody, it's me, Rick Acosta, the Dodger Card Collector, coming to you with another video. Today is Thursday, January 19th. We're getting close. What are we getting close to? We're getting close to a lot of things that I'm going to talk about today. Now, the first thing uh, I'm going to talk about and that you probably noticed is I now have intro music to my program. <laughs> that is the Harry Simone songsters performing It's a Beautiful Day for a Ball Game. If you grew up in Los Angeles, this song was played before every Dodger game. Uh, radio, for sure. Television, I remember it in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, the Dodgers actually still play this song today, I believe, before their pregame show. Um, in doing research for this song, I also noticed that the uh, Cubs and the Mets have also used this song at some point. So if you've never heard it, it's on the Baseball's Greatest Hits CD. And I decided, like I said, uh, it was raining here in California. I needed something to do. And I just sat there and I go, I'm going to create in an intro and an outro for my program. When I went to college, I had a radio and TV background. And my professors always taught me, whether it was a radio program or a video program, you need to have an intro. You need to have an outro. So what the heck? I thought I'd give it a try. I don't know if I'll keep it, but uh, I'm going to give it a try just to see what happens. All right, so what do I got going on All right, here? We got it's sports. We just we had the big weekend of the NFL playoffs. Uh, I think this weekend are going to be really good games. I'm really rooting for the Cowboys to beat the 49ers because I can't just can't stand the 49ers. Uh, I'm a Rams fan. We don't root for the 49ers. I think the Eagles will win their game. I think the Chiefs are going to beat the Jaguars, and I don't know who's going to win the Bills and the Bengals. I, I just don't know. It's it's going to be a great game. Uh, so let's see what happens there. Uh, from my hockey friends out there, this week I bought my tickets for Dustin Brown night. Uh, the Kings are taking on the Pittsburgh Penguins February 11th at Staples Center. And Dustin Brown is having his jersey, his number retired. His jersey's going up into the rafters at Staples Center. He's getting a statue I know some of you are going, who on earth is Dustin Brown? <laughs> uh, Two-time captain of the LA Kings, and it's going to be a big deal. The Kings are really good in in their statues. You know, Wayne Gretzky has a statue. Luke Robitaille has a statue. Um, our broadcaster, Bob Miller, has a statue. And now Dustin Brown's getting one. So I can't wait. I will probably be talking about it more between now and February 11th. I might even try and buy myself a Dustin Brown hockey card. Uh, in commemoration of that. So what else is going on? Now, it's it's late. It's, it's Well, it's still mid to late January. But for me, this is when I start thinking about baseball. And I'm so excited about this upcoming season. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big Dodger fan. You guys know that. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different season. But for me personally, this is going to be a big year. This, um, this year will mark the 50th anniversary of me attend of, of attending my very first game at Dodger Stadium. And I'm really excited about that. And I'm actually going to attend a game, not on that day, because unfortunately the Dodgers are going to be playing the Mets out east. But uh, I hope to commemorate it by taking my family, uh, sitting down the first baseline in the field section where we sat originally in 1973. I actually have a program based around it that day that I'm going to probably show somewhere around then. Uh, pretty excited about that. And this will also mark my 50th anniversary of me starting my baseball collection. My baseball collection started in April of 1973. I don't know the date. I just know it was in the first week or two of the season. And uh, I, while I haven't been in the hobby collecting all those 50 years, I've been in and out quite a bit. 
Uh, it's going to be a big time anniversary. Also shows you that I'm getting old. Oh, yeah. Let's not even go there. Oh, speaking of getting old, I have a birthday coming up at the end of the month. And I was actually sent this by uh, Memory Lane. They sent me a birthday card. Do you guys get these? I, I didn't even know they did that. I, I didn't even know they knew. I, they must have my birth date down on their website. So they sent me a birthday card. Thank you, Memory Lane. Um, Hobby-wise, I mentioned to you last week that I was going to go to a show that usually stinks. I've been going to it for a year, and it's just awful. I walk in. Five minutes later, I walk out. I uh, hadn't been in a while, but I was getting my haircut, and I have to drive through that particular neighborhood to get home. And I decided oh, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to stop and see what's going on over there. Pleasantly surprised, the crowd was bigger. There were more uh, people selling cards. There was um, the owner of the show now has a section for supplies, tons of supplies. By the way, my LA Orange County peeps, especially Orange County peeps, this shows in Placentia. Uh, the Diamond Nine Sports Card Show. Plenty of supplies. Nine pocket sheets, eight pocket sheets, dividers, which I bought some, top loaders, a penny sleeves. Um, but I was really happy to see they actually had three to four tables selling vintage. Uh, for those of you out east or in the Midwest, I think you guys might take it for granted that there's vintage at every show that you walk into. I've seen a lot of your videos. You guys walk into the tiniest shows and there's still some incredible baseball cards. That doesn't happen here in California. So I was really pleased to see there was there was a few guys that looked like they were selling their uh, their private collections. One guy was selling his 1958 tops. He was he had a dollar box of vintage cards. There was another table. Uh, he had play balls. He had Gaudis. He had a 1916 Mickey Mantle. Uh, and there was another gentleman selling a bunch of late 60s, early 70s cards. It was just nice to see. Uh, I didn't pick anything up uh, just because nothing from my uh, from my want list was on there. But it was just nice to be able to look at some vintage cards in person, uh, be able to talk to these guys. You know, the, some of these sellers, they, they want to talk about baseball cards, too. And it was just really pleasant uh, to attend this show. So my Orange County peeps or East San Gabriel Valley, check out the Diamond Nine Sports Card Show in Placentia, California. Uh, I think I'm going to start going out there a little bit more often. It's about a 20 minute drive for me, but it might be worth it. So what else? I've got a couple of eBay winnings that I'm going to uh, hopefully show off in the coming weeks. And I'm currently watching some cards in uh, the Robert Edwards auction, the REA auction that ends this week. And I'm still watching some cards in eBay. So I'm I'm hoping to have a big week, but you never know. You just never know. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to talk about, this is my final installment of the 1941 Play Ball set. So I've shown you three videos, and this is my fourth featuring the last ten. So let's turn the camera, and we'll take a look. So we're going to take a look at the last group of ten cards. Some of these cards you've seen in previous videos. So I'll try to talk about something different than I did in the previous video. So we're going to start off. You're going to see a trend here of Dodger cards at the beginning. First up on the list is Dolph Camilli, card number 51. He was the 1941 National League MVP, batting uh, 285 and hitting 34 home runs and 120 RBIs. And he also led the league in strikeouts that year with 115. He was a member of the National League All-Star team. After his MVP season in 1942, he finished second in the National League in home runs and batted and runs batted in. And that year, he also broke uh, Zach Wheat's club record of 131 home runs. Eventually, he'd be passed by Gil Hodges uh, and Duke Snyder. In July of 1943, he was traded to the New York Giants, but refused to report to the Dodgers' hated rivals. Instead, he went on to manage the Oakland Oaks of the Old Pacific Coast League in 1944 and 1945, before returning to the majors as a player, joining the Boston Red Sox in mid-1945, where he only batted 212 with two home runs in his last season as a player. Uh, he was later a scout for the Yankees and the California Angels before finishing his baseball career as a spring training instructor with the Yankees. To, uh, make that the Angels. I said the Yankees. 
Uh, next up on the list, if you've seen the movie 42, the story about Jackie Robinson, you'll know this name, Walter Higby or Kirby Higby. Uh, he had his best season in 1941, winning a league leading 22 games and losing nine. He established career highs in many pitching categories, including 48 appearances, 39 starts. He was the league leader in both of those categories and 298 innings pitched. His performance was good enough for seventh place in NL MVP voting. Uh, baseball's color line, as you know, was broken in 1947 when Jackie Robinson was brought up from Montreal to Brooklyn. And when Branch Rickey announced that Robinson was to play for the Dodgers, Higby was one of the Brooklyn players who protested Rickey's decision. Subsequently, Kirby was traded to the Pittsburgh Pirates in a deal that brought Al Gianfrido to the Dodgers. Gianfrido is most famous for his heroic catch of a drive off the bat of New York Yankees Joe DiMaggio in Game 6 of the 1947 World Series. The Dodgers led the Yankees 8-5 going into the bottom of the sixth inning when Gianfrido was brought in as a defensive replacement. Snuffy Sternweiss and Yogi Berra were on base. When DiMaggio drove the ball to the 415-foot marker, Gianfrido raced across the field and caught the ball several steps before crashing into the bullpen gate. DiMaggio shook his head and kicked at the dirt in frustration. Uh, if you've never seen that video, it's, it's a good video. You can find that on YouTube. Um, back to Higby. After a few years with the Pirates, he went on to, uh, he went on to pitch several years in the minor leagues. After his playing days, Higby had several, uh, several jobs, including working for the post office. After he resigned from the post office, he signed on with a chemical company, but that evaporated in nine months, putting him out of work. Bills were piling up with no money coming in. A desperate Higby wrote several bad checks and was ordered to pay them off. When he couldn't, he was sentenced to 60 days in Richmond County Jail. Uh, there was a sympathetic guard, got Higby a job in the jail as a trustee, cleaning the cells, and Higby had his own room in the jail. Uh, not only did he get out of after 40 days, but he got a job as a, as a guard at the jail. He stayed there for two years, uh, then quit, thinking he was about to get a better job with the South Carolina Tax Commission. That didn't happen, and Kirby was out of work for six months. Finally, he got a job at a, at a state penitentiary, penitentiary as a guard, uh, but Higby unfortunately just couldn't keep out of trouble. Uh, to make extra money, he began smuggling sleeping pills into the prison for inmates, and he was eventually caught and pleaded guilty. The judge was lenient and gave Higby a three-year suspended sentence uh, and three years probation. Kirby finally did get some relief, though, when he started receiving his $210 a month major league pension plan. Uh, looking back at that time in 1947, Higby insisted on being traded when Brooklyn added Jackie Robinson to the team as the first black player in the 20th century. And according to Higby, the Dodgers, uh, the, the Dodger players who were opposed to having Robinson on the team didn't have anything personal against Jackie Robinson or any other Negro, but we were Southerners who had never lived or played with Negroes, and we didn't see any reason to start them. So that's a take a look back at Kirby Higby. Next on our list is my one SGC card of this set. This is Luke Hamlin. At some point, I'm going to have to uh, either re-slab or get a... If I want to be in the PSA set registry, which I do, I'm going to have to get a PSA card of this one. Uh, not much to say for, for Luke. He was he went 8-8 eight eight in 1941. Uh, he was a previous 20-game winner in 1939. But by 1941, his, uh, his career was definitely in decline. Uh, Hamlin won the uh, nickname Hot Potato because of his tendency to juggle the ball while getting ready to pitch. So that is a look at Luke Hot Potato Hamlin. Here's another card we sh showed off previously. That's the 1941 Pee Wee Reese. Pee Wee came up to the Dodgers after a trade with the Red Sox in 1940. 
His rookie season was curtailed by a broken heel bone that limited to 84 games in what looked to be a promising uh, season. He had a 200, he had a 272 batting average with 58 runs scored. In 1941, he hit 229 and led the league with 47 errors. Even playing in the World Series that year was a forgettable experience for Reese. He batted 200 and made three errors in the five-game Yankee win. One of the most popular players with both his teammates and the fans, the Little Colonel, was the Dodgers team captain. And he, not the manager, brought out the lineup card at the start of their games. Reese and Helston Howard have the dubious distinction of playing on the most losing teams, six each. Uh, Reese's only World Series win as a player with the Dodgers was obviously during the 1955 World Series. He did serve as a coach on the 1959 Los Angeles Dodgers World Series team. And the last Dodger that we are featuring is Whit Wyatt. Wyatt's best year was also 1941 when he was 22 and 10 with a league leading seven shutouts. He was the winning pitcher in the only Dodgers victory against the New York Yankees in the 1941 World Series. And he also pitched well in 1942, winning 19 games and leading the Dodgers in wins again. During his most productive period, 1940 to 1943, uh, Wyatt went 70-36 and 36 and led the league in shutouts twice. Now, in addition to being one of the best pitchers in the league, he also gained notoriety for headhunting. When a beanball war broke out between frontrunners uh, Brooklyn and St. Louis in 1941, Wyatt was at the forefront. Manager Leo DeRocher would leave money on the top of his locker after he, after he hit batters. My favorite quote, though, about, about Whit Wyatt was from Joe DiMaggio, Joe DiMaggio, who only faced Wyatt in one World Series, yet called him the meanest guy he ever saw. Whit Wyatt. Love, love hearing stories about these old guys. All right, we're finally done with the Dodgers, and we're going to move on to card number 59. That's going to be Bill Jurgis, who played with the Chicago Cubs and the New York Giants from 1931 to 1947. In July of 1932, Jurgis recovered from gunshot wounds suffered when a distraught former girlfriend tried to kill him. After that, he led the uh, he helped lead the clubs the Cubs to the pennant in nineteen ninety in nineteen thirty two. Now, much has been discussed regarding the Eddie Wake's shooting in a Chicago hotel room in nineteen forty nine, which may have inspired author Bernard Malamud in penning the story of Roy Hobbs in his no in his novel The Natural. On July sixth, nineteen thirty two, Violet Valley, a showgirl with whom Jurgis was romantically linked, tried to kill Jurgis at the Hotel Carlos where both lived. Jurgis had previously tried to end their relationship. Valley also left a suicide note in which she blamed uh, Chicago Cubs outfielder Kiki Kyler or Kai Kai Kyler for uh, convincing Jurgis to break up with her. Although initial reports stated that Jurgis was shot while trying to wrestle the gun from Valley, uh, later reports based on Valley's suicide note stated that she was trying to kill Jurgis as well as commit suicide. Now, a week after the shooting, charges were dismissed against Valley when Jurgis appeared in court and announced that he would not testify and wished to drop charges. Now, after the excitement of his playing days, Jurgis went on to replace Pinky Higgins, who uh, I brought up in a previous video, as manager of the Boston Red Sox for parts of the 1959 and 1960 season. And taking a look at this card, I, here's another card. This set has just incredible backgrounds. And this is just a good looking, good looking one. I like the stirrups he also has down here. I mentioned this in a previous video. I miss stirrups on baseball players. They, it inspired me during my Little League years. Okay, continuing on, we have Tommy Bridges a three-time 20-game winner and six-time All-Star. He played for the Tigers for 16 seasons from 1930 to 1946. Uh, his best seasons were from 1934 to 1936, where 
Uh, he won uh, 22, 21, and 23 games respectively while helping lead the Detroit Tigers to the 1935 World Series. Uh, Bridges and Hank Greenberg are the only players in Detroit Tigers history to play in four World Series for the teams, having appeared in the 1934, 1935, 1940, and 1945 World Series. His team, his team record for career strikeouts was broken in 1951 by Hal, New, uh, Hal Newhauser, and he remained the top mark for a right-hander until Jack Morris broke it in 1988. Uh, Bridges' career record with the Tigers was 194 wins, 138 losses, with a 3.57 ERA. Next on our list, it's going to be Walt, or Wally, Jednich. And he played primarily for uh, the St. Louis Browns for five years, but was a member of the world champion Cleveland Indians his one year there in 1948. Uh, he was originally signed by the New York Yankees, eventually making it to the AAA level and playing with the Newark Bears of the International League in 1939. Before the 1940 season, though, Judnich was sold to the St. Louis Browns after not being offered a major league contract, as the Yankees had someone named Joe DiMaggio as an everyday center fielder. Uh, so Judnich was considered expendable, obviously. Okay, next... Is going to be Jack Knott. He also played with the St. Louis Browns, the Chicago White Sox, and the Philadelphia Athletics over an 11-year career. He led the league in a save. He, he led the American League in saves with a whopping seven in 1935. But he also uh, gave up the most earned runs allowed, 156 in 1936, and home runs, 25 in 1937. How he lasted 11 seasons, I'll never know. But in his 11 seasons, he had a record of 82 wins, 103 losses, and 325 games. Jack Knott. And last, but definitely not least on this list, is card number 71. A guy by the name of Joe DiMaggio. 1941 AL MVP, World Series champion, American League All-Star, 50 games, 56 game hitting streak. We all know this stuff. Uh, breaking the MLB record for the longest hitting streak. And his run lasted from May 15th to July 16th, during which he had a 408 batting average. Um, DiMaggio Street surpassed the single season record of 44 games that was held by Willie Keeler since 1987, or 1897, I should say. And the record set up by DiMaggio still exists, and his been described as unbreakable. Let's go a little bit deeper, though, into the streak, because during that 56-game streak uh, that, that uh, he DiMaggio had 91 base hits and 223 at-bats for a 408 batting average. He had 55 runs batted in during this period, and his hit count included 15 home runs. His 56 runs scored matched the number of games in his streak, and in the final 11 games, DiMaggio had a 545, yes, 545 batting average with 24 hits and 44 at-bats. Um, DiMaggio faced the Browns and the White Sox 12 times during the streak, the most of any AL opponent. Uh, the Athletics and the Senators were his least common foes, with the Yankees having played each team five times. However, DiMaggio had his highest batting average against the Athletics, batting four or 524 against them. The Yankees moved up significantly in the American League standings during the streak. Before it started, they were five and a half games out of first place in the American League. And by the time the streak ended, the Yankees had improved to 56 and 27 for the season and were on top of the American League by seven games over the Indians. Their uh, record during the streak was 41-13, and 13, along with two ties. So what happened after, the day after the streak ended? We all know the streak ended after 56 games, and DiMaggio went hitless uh, in the 57th game. But DiMaggio recorded two hits off of Bob Feller in the next game, and he posted at least one base hit in the following 15 games as well. 
the streak breaking contest was the only one in 73 game span in which Joe DiMaggio did not have a hit. The Yankees won the American League pennant by 17 game margin and defeated my Brooklyn Dodgers in the 1941 World Series. DiMaggio was voted the MVP in the American League, beating out Ted Williams, who batted over 400 for that season. So that is the information about Joe DiMaggio. Love this card. Uh, I mentioned this in a previous video. I never thought I would own it. And uh, so that's where we're at right now with the 1941 play ball set. 40 cards down, 32 more to go. We'll see how I do the rest of the way, but I hope uh, you've enjoyed the ride so far. I know I am. So I'll be back next week with another video. And in the meanwhile, in the meantime, I'm going to leave you with some closing credits. Have a good day, you guys. It's a beautiful day for a ball game.